He is the founder of Exonerated Nation, and he spent 18 years behind bars for a crime he did not commit. Let's bring him on. Mr. Obi Anthony, how are you, sir? Doing fine. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thank you for being here and uh, sharing your story. So I, I always start here. Before we even go into what happened back in 1994, uh, tell me the young man that you were before all this happened to you. And, you know, <laughs> I, I, I was a young man. I had just lost my mom. My mother had just mm. passed away uh, right in January the 1994 of Northwich earthquake had happened. And uh, I was working with the California Conservation Corps at the time, also as a janitor. Um, I was in between basically, you know, adhering to my mom's, you know, instructions to do the right thing, leaving the guys in the streets alone, work and do that, and then losing her and then being framed for this. You lost your mother in, in the earthquake? Right after. So the Northridge earthquake happened. Um, what was that, January, like the third or somewhere around in there? It happened the early part of January. And my mom wow. passed away uh, a couple of weeks thereafter. Well, for folks who don't know, uh, this you're, 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 you're based in Cali. Yes. So, yeah, well, I'm, I'm sorry. That must have been tough then to have this happen to you a short time later. So just to give people uh, a background of what happened, March 27th, 1994, a man named Felipe Angelis, Am I saying that right, yeah. <laughs> Angelis? Uh, he was uh, shot and killed by two men outside of an apartment in L.A. Uh, this apartment was being used as a brothel. You are nowhere to be found. You're not at the scene. You don't know these people. You are completely removed from this, this uh, situation completely. Exactly. And where the story gets crazy is that there is a pimp who who says that well i see this guy at the scene of the crime and this pimp is also an informant right he's an informant right. yeah and what's crazier is this pimp he was convicted of murder and shot his wife twice in the head may she rest in peace so so tragic but he got probation wow. to work with the police yeah as i'm reading your story i'm like this is just crazy. Yeah, so, right. so a few, so you are, were you, were you arrested for an unrelated charge, right? Completely right. unrelated. Correct. So you're arrested for an unrelated charge. And this pimp just says, this is the guy, Obi Anthony tells me, tell me what happens when you hear that you are a suspect for this shooting back in, back in March of 94. I'm, I'm, the first words out of my mouth is that you got the wrong guy. Are you sure you got the right booking number? My blast three is seven, six, six or seven, no, six, seven, six. And they was like, yeah, your last name is Anthony. First name is Obi. I'm like, yes. He's like, well, this is you. And you're being booked for a murder, three attempted murders. I'm just, I'm, I'm like, when, where? First only thing I can, only thing come on mind, what murder? When? When did it happen? How? Well, like, what are you talking about? So I was totally surprised, shocked, and un, you know, I, I just, I don't know. It's hard to explain that brush of like, what are you talking about? Emotions that's happening, specifically when you're getting accused of something as serious as that. Like, no, you definitely got to like, wait, wait a minute. Like, what are you talking about? So. Yeah. And what's wild is that uh, there's no physical evidence. Uh, you 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 weren't there the night of the of the murder right yet the the prosecutor decides to go forward with this you with, know with, it's, go ahead. you know it, it was you, you're right i mean like i'm sorry to interrupt you but you're right because sometimes i you know i think about when i sat there in the preliminary hearing and the prosecutor was representing to the court the information that he was utilizing to bound me over for a trial and it was nothing. You're right. They had no physical evidence. There was no fingerprints, no shoe prints, no, uh, no reliable identification that put me at the scene of the crime outside of this pimp or the brothel that they, there was an informant that had subsequently, like you said, and he was testifying in two other cases that he had allegedly witnessed that was a murder. And so um, they had nothing to bound me over, nothing to send me. In. And so it was, uh, 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 it was just uh, that for me, 
not only was it an overzealous prosecution, but it was also, it was, it was just a, it was a, a, an example of how easily it is for individuals that grew up in my community to be disposed of um, by way, with, with absolutely nothing. Not only was I proven factually innocent, actually innocent of the crime, but it was information and evidence there that showed that this guy, the pimp, was the one who actually killed this dude. And they knew it, and they had it, and they kept it. And so what they did was intentional to me. It wasn't on accident. It wasn't a wrongful thing. It was, I was framed. And this was something that I, that they did purposefully and intentionally to me and my co-defendant, Reggie Cole. And you were 19 years old. Yeah. You're sorry, not, man. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. Absolutely. I mean, this is this is trauma. This is trauma. I mean, you're night and in '94, I was I was I was 17. I was 17. So I just I can't imagine how this how this felt. How was your family affected by this? I mean, you've you've lost your mother sadly, so you're going through that. But how right. you know how was that? How was your other family affected by this? I mean, I had two close siblings. I got three older sisters in the state of California, two of which was, we were close. We grew up together and all of the above. Um, when this happened, right after my mom passed, they were they were both shocked and like, they didn't know what to do. One, none of us was in a financial situation to be able to do anything. We were inner city individuals. We grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't have the best upcoming. Our mom uh, consequently was addicted to drugs in her, in her, in her, in her coming up and so, uh, wasn't like we had the best of the worlds in Los Angeles. And so when this happened, it was, it was, they was, it just disrupted everything. Not only that, but the consequence time that I spent in prison, because it was, you know, it was difficult for them, as they tell me now, to come there to see me in prison. And so that's why they didn't come. When I, like I told them, it was even more difficult for me because I'm sitting there by myself with no visitation for 14 years from none of them. And it was just like, you know, but what about that part of it? You know, I get that y'all got this thing. So it just, it totally jacked our family unit up. To this very day, we don't have any relationship. I don't even talk to them, they don't talk to me. We have like, it's been about like five years since we said anything to one another. Wow. So, you know, it, 14 it, it, years of, of no visitors. Wow. That's rough. Right. Um, I want to ask you this because I couldn't find this when I was researching your case. And I think this is important because black men are seven times more black, not even black men, black people, men or men or women are right. seven times more likely to be wrongfully convicted. Right. What are the racial dynamics here? Is the pimp is 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 he black or the prosec is are the prosecutors white? What what are the, the dynamics here? So the dynamics here is you know they're fairly mixed, but nevertheless you have to you know it's, you know you have a couple of different things that placate that mix, right? So one of you know so you had you had a uh, so Costello, I believe, is a Hispanic prosecutor, um, or you know, and then the, the, the judge was also of Asian descent. Um, the the lead detective Marcella Wynn was an African American woman. Um, the the pimp was a black male. Uh, the guy who had gotten Felipe, who rest in peace, was a Hispanic guy. Um, and so uh, you know had a, a healthy little mix. You know what I mean? It was a mix. It wasn't. It's, you know that's why I always say that. You know in my in my case, the racial sort of epic sort of thing that was going on there was the cross-racial identification that transpired. The Hispanic guy who clearly said from the very gate that one, that I only looked like the guy. He didn't pick me out in a live lineup. When he seen a, when he seen a photo, he just said, he just looks like the guy and that was it. He, they brought him in the courtroom and then the court, I don't know if you've seen that, that he said this. He told the court, well, it was only through my dreams that I can identify him. Only through my dreams. I was, I had a dream and that's how I know it's him. That's what's his testimony in the courtroom. And so I'm like, I'm, this is not happening to me. While meanwhile, the pimp of the brothel who then admitted in the court, well, hey, listen, 
you know, it was pretty dark out there. I couldn't really see. The fourth guy could have been a dog. Because allegedly, uh, the original thing was it was four individuals, then it went to three individuals, and then they had two. So it went down, down, down until they just settled on me and Reggie Cole. And so, you know, it just is a whole lot of different things that they did intentionally to us. When you, if you were sitting in the courtroom, you would be saying, like, this is just, they're not doing right. it. They're not doing this to this. Are they doing this? They're doing this. Yeah, they did that to me and to him. And again, like I always tell people this, that's, you know, you don't do stuff like to, to people on an accident. You know, uh, when, we, when, I, when, I, when I think about something wrong, it's because you did it out of an ignorance or out of a na naivete. You did it was a wrong, I, I, my bad. I didn't know. But when you do something intentionally, I don't think that you could say, you could call it a wrong. Something else, that's, a, that's an intentional act that you do to a person. And for me, that was an attempt to murder on my life. Anytime, specifically the 22 months I spent in the LA County Jail, I could have got killed. I've seen people get killed. I know people do die in there, in the LA County Jail. Now it's not even the prison. So that could have been me at any time. So they did that. Hmm. You know what I also think, Mr. Anthony, I think that um, there's this phrase from Zora Neale Hurston where she says, not all my skin folk are my kin folk. And there's also this book called Locking Up Our Own. Right. And I think there are some black and brown people who want that proximity to power so much, right. who want to be, look at the pimp, you know, they said, hey, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll help you out, you know, you'll get, you'll, you'll be, it's kind of like, imagine if we're on a plantation, hey, you know, we'll give you some freedom if you right. sell out everybody else. Right. So I think there's a, a real toxicity there that happens yeah. in our communities when we get in that law enforcement, that criminal justice where we just don't care. So right, right. it's really that's nuanced. What that's what happened, you're right. Because when we look at, when I think about, you know, people say, ask me, am I angry about the situation? And I had a lot of time to think about that, what you just talked about, right? And I thought about Marcella Wynn, the lead detective in this case, who was a training officer up front of a Hispanic guy by the name of Pete Resistance. And so I thought about her environment and her having to play up to the good old boys in the detective office, being the only black female in the detective office in the depression, in other words, that she may have had to play on that was playing upon her, that made her make the choices that she did and how she acted and, and against me and Reggie Cole. So I thought about all of those things as well. But then at the end of the day, it's almost like, well, you know, you know, we wake up with just two things, right? A, a choice and a chance. And so, and she had a choice and a chance to do the right thing, but she didn't, you know? She just decided that this is the easiest thing to do for me to get to that place of power. Mm -hmm. So. So you are uh, sentenced to life without parole. Uh, this happens, I believe, November of 1995. Is that correct? Yeah. You're sentenced to life without parole. So you've already been in LA County Jail. Uh, from what I've heard is, 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 is hell. Yeah. So uh, as you are going in this young man, uh, what are you thinking going behind bars and having this conviction about just survival skills? Cause all we hear about, I mean, you talked about seeing violence in LA County. So, yeah. I mean, like this is, you know, LA being in, you know, as long as I stayed in the LA County jail for 22 months, it's, it doesn't condition you, but it makes you aware about the pot, what probably is in front of you, right? In the event that you go to prison or any of those things. And, you know, yeah, and, and yes, yes, there is, for me, I believe it was more violence that I witnessed in the LA County Jail than I witnessed in the penitentiary itself. And so what happened was when I got, when my feet touched the penitentiary grounds January, 1996, and I went to corporate. Uh, which is now referenced to as Old Corcoran State Penitentiary. And at that time, they was on a lockdown because the inmates had attacked the correction officers on one of the yards, and they had been locked down for a whole year. So when I got there, they were in a lockdown situation. I, can, I didn't see nobody. I didn't know anything. I was being marshaled back and forth to the shower in handcuffs in my boxers. Didn't know, couldn't see it, and didn't know nobody, didn't know nothing. 
And so I had, in my mind, it was like, you know, I, you know, I, I remember watching that show Pretender, you know, when I was growing up, it was the show Pretender Jared. He, you know, he was, the, he used to do everything. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I imagined that part, right? I had to pretend that I had already been, like I was, like I've been there before. Like, you know, it had been people there, it was there, people in penitentiary that, that was there on that yard as long as I've been on the face of the planet. I was only 19. It was people there for 23 years already. And so I had to pretend as though I was that this is not new to me. And so that I wouldn't be gobbled up by something I didn't know. Mm. And how are you, uh, I guess you kind of answered that, but I, I think about the year, 17, 18 years, just the, the time, you know, ending your teens, your 20s, your 30s. How are you getting by with uh, just that? Because time we can't get back. We're losing right. time every day. So how, do, how did you get through just the time? I mean, you know, you, you do it in a couple of different ways, right? You, you know, it's, uh, for me, I read a lot, right? And not only did I read a lot, but I, you know, I communed a lot with the different individuals within the, within the institutions. And so, uh, you know, from that, you learn a lot of wisdom and you, that individuals that you can kind of, that helps you keep a hold of your hope. Mm. Uh, not only keep a hold to it, but uh, realize and understand that it's, 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 it's a knowing, not a belief that my, my hope is, I know my hope. I don't have to believe in it. I know it. So those kind of conversations, the kind of conversations also that was there for me that helped me understand that, you know, listen, that, uh, you know, it's 24 hours in a day that doesn't make our week what it is. It's only one day. And, and so our past is our present and our future is our now. So we have to be, we have to, we have to live in the now. We have to understand that. We have to appreciate those things around us so that we can get the betterment out of all things, regardless of whether it's bad or good. And so I had to take the bad thing that was happening to me and to turn it into something good. So I, you know what I mean? It was just, you know, it's not a, you know, I always tell people, you know, you don't, uh, penitentiary is not what they show you on, on TV. <laughs> you know, it's right. a good, it's a good illustration, but you know, it's just you there in that eight by 10 cell uh, with someone who you do not know that you have to get along with. You have to, you know, I, you know, I tell people all of the time, like, uh, you know, it's difficult for me now to have man to woman conversations because for 17 mm -hmm. years I had to have man to man conversations that was dominated with nothing but uh, masculinity and that was it and so it was no room for compromise it was either this or that and so I had to I have to get back into the rhythm of those things now you know wow that is that is so powerful tell me how you are eventually exonerated how that eventually happens so <laughs> You know, so like I said, I was I was I was framed with a guy by the name of Reggie Cole. Uh, Reggie was doing time down at Calipatria State Prison at this time in 1999, 2000, or 2020, or yeah, yeah, the year 2000. Uh, and I was at Cal and I was at Corcoran. Reggie was getting bullied by this prison guy by this guy named the Devil, nicknamed the Devil, and consequently one day. Reggie decided to defend himself. He stabbed the guy there on the yard. The guy died because me and Reggie both had life without already. Um, they was trying to put Reggie on death row. He got an attorney by the name of Christopher Plour, who was also was working with CIP at San Diego at the university down there. Um, on some cases, uh, they began to start reinvestigating his original case, was, which was our case. And they begin to start to discover not only that this pimp received the deal to testify, but the prosecutor had known about it and that there was information that was held withheld from us. He then reached out to me um, and like the attorney reached out to me in like 2001 and told me that he was uh, reinvestigating the case, that he was Reggie Coe's attorney, 
that there may be some information there that can exonerate me, but that he's Reggie's attorney that I had to, you know, reach out to somebody to represent me, but that he was, you know, then an investigator would be coming to see me. And so uh, that's what started the ball moving. And that was in 2001. And you're finally released October 4th, 2011, correct? Yeah, 10 years later. That's when you're finally, but that, that's not when you're exonerated. Do I have that right? Yeah, I was exonerated. Yeah, you're right. So I was, yeah, you're right. I got exonerated September 30th. The judge came back with his exoneration, his ruling on September 30th. Um, ORB immediately that day. However, uh, you know, penitentiary, you know, probably, you know, Barack, so they, you know, they, they played the paperwork game. Well, we got to wait to get this. We can't just let me in. And so I sat in the county jail for some additional days and walked out, actually walked out of the county jail uh, October 4th for that year. And you were 37 years old when you were finally, when you were finally uh, released. Yeah. You know, you kind of alluded to it before as far as, you know, just conversations and, you know, talking with women and so on. But how do you, how have you been able to, it's been about 10 years, but how have you been able to navigate the trauma? Like how, how, how have you been able to just go through this and navigate what you've been through being out here in this quote unquote real world? Right. Uh, Cause I've been, I'm stuck, bro. Like I can't, I cannot over under understated and overstated, but I'm stuck in the fight mode. I just, it's just, I, it's just, it's never broke. Right. And so I've been dealing with it like that. I've been dealing with my, my trauma by trying to come out of the fight mode, which is, you know, you, you have fight, flight, or freeze, right? You know, you know, the state of beings, right? And so, and sometimes, you know, you have, when, you, when you're cool, you have a balance of those things. But for me, because, you know, like I said, it took 17 years of my life, I fought for my freedom. That's all I knew. And so when I got out, I had to continue to do that. Because when I got out, there was nothing there for me. There was no social work. There was no psychology. There was no, no nothing, no, no nothing for me. No help with housing, no nothing. And so I began to start advocating for that. And I began to start entrenching myself to help other individuals. And I realized and understood that that helped me. That being able to sort of witness or help someone else in their suffering or whatever they're going through, help me with mine. Uh, so to be able to find it or help find a solution for them gave me an avenue to help me at the same time. And that's how I've been dealing with it. One of the great things that you did, uh, again, you, you founded Exonerated Nation, but you also, uh, you, you, you helped to pass this policy, Obi's Law, yeah. which basically for folks who don't know, when a lot of people are released, they have no identification. They have, they have nothing. They, they've been behind bars for all this amount of time. They have no ID and right. you can't do anything without ID, especially in this electronic age. There's no, right. nothing you can do without any kind of ID. Right. And now you ha there's a law in Cali that basically the DMV has to provide ID for people who are being released. So explain what, what Obi's law did and, and the work that you managed to do around that. Man, you know, uh, you know, I'm really appreciative to the legislators and the assembly individuals there at the state capitol in California because they're, they acted. Uh, when it came to AB 672, which was renamed Obi's Law, and specifically uh, Assembly Member uh, Joan Sawyer, at, who who sponsored the bill. Um, so you know, they, they, so Obi's Law was 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 a result of a conversation that I was having with the Assembly individuals about some of the things that that happened when I walked out of the door. It took me up to three to four months to get ID. I couldn't do anything because the Department of Motor Vehicles disposed of my identification after the 10 years of inactivity. And that was, that was all because the California Department of Corrections was not keeping my identification updated with them as required to. And so the, the disposal of our identifications happened and it creates a process to where it takes anywhere between three to five to six months to get that. If one is without housing or assistance when they come home, uh, that leads them to wander about in the streets with no ID. And that's a, 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 a direct result of them and their failure, nothing else. And so the assembly individuals acted and not only did they act in there, but they also connected that bill to 
also help individuals who who come home after exonerations to at least the same things the individuals had that came home on parole, on probation or parole. And that was the whole thing because the innocent individuals in the state of California was coming home with no help at all. And they was giving and individuals who was coming home on probation and parole, got $200 gate money, got you know the parole agent, they helped them connect them to services, they did all of the things that, that they do or don't do. Uh, but nevertheless, the individuals who was innocent, you turn your back, you know, you just let them out with nothing with no direction, no help, no ID, no nothing, and have them to do those things. And like what you just said, like, I have been gone since 94. This is 2011. And it was like, you know, everything was on the, on the phone. Everything had been totally transformed. Even the process of me going to go get the ID had changed tremendously. Yeah. So you were compensated by the state of California, but of course, no compensation can make up for what they took from you and what you know what you still struggle with i'm curious to know did anybody did the detective that you mentioned the black woman detective the the judge the prosecutor did anybody apologize and take any kind of ownership no no one involved in my case has took any kind of ownership i mean like it was just so many different hands that was involved even to the to a reporter by the name of Miles Cohen, who was the reporter who was following along the detectives back in 1994, who wrote an article and then wrote a book, who had a sh shell cases that the detectives gave him the next morning after the crime happened and that he had kept as a souvenir for 23 years until civil complaint came, he was deposed, deposed, he then brings this box with a shell case in it, saying, hey, look, the detectives gave me this the next morning on the roof. My civil wow. attorney runs it, sends it to ballistics, and it comes back to connect it to the crime scene. And this wow. shithead dude, excuse my language, could have been gave that up. To my attorney back then, they could have been did that. I would have never went to jail. I would have never been to prison. Because they would have known that somebody in that building did some shooting and possibly killed that dude. So, you know, no, nah, man, nobody said anything. And as a matter of fact, everybody progressed and was and went off and was doing great. The prosecutor got a vest, the detective win went on to be celebrated. He's now, you know, he's now a professor or teaching at UCLA. Wow. Uh, so no, man, I'm the only one suffering and still suffering. No one else. Yeah, she's getting a pension. You know, they paying her. Everybody's doing great. Uh, of no concern about what happened to me while I was in there or since I've been out. What's been happening with me? Uh, this is not an easy dance to dance after being off the dance floor for so long. You know, you lose your rhythm, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. new dance things happen now. You know, they got all kind of stuff and you lost out there. Now you got to sit with your back up against the wall. You know, so. It's, it's crazy. I, I, whether it's the Exonerated Five or the, the countless folks I've interviewed every Wednesday, over and over, these prosecutors, these detectives, these DAs, there's no accountability. I mean, how many other people are wrongfully behind bars that we don't know about that this detective may have did the work? I mean, how many other, it's just like all their cases should be investigated. And it's just, well, it's just. With the her, devil. the detectives in my case, it has been shown that she is responsible, who's all been exonerated now at this point, five individuals. Wow. And wow. take this in consideration that me and Reggie Cole was her first case that she had. She wow. framed everybody. Five people thereafter. She framed me and Reggie Cole. She also framed Susan Millen. She also framed Michelle. And there's another case now that she has her hand in of an individual who has a claim of innocence. Wow. And they pan her. 
they're there she's being rewarded she's being rewarded for that they kind of crazy they pay that's crazy they pay <sighs> well Mr. Anthony, I want to thank you for your work. I want to thank you for uh, Exonerated Nation uh, founding that. I want to thank you for telling your story. It's so important that we get these stories out here. Uh, you're, you're a survivor, and I'm just really grateful that you, you opened up to us. I think we all have to learn. And I, and I think what you said earlier about, you know, uh, just the trauma that happens after, that just because you get a settlement doesn't mean that, you know, it eases any kind of pain and you can't get the time back. Right. Is there anything else you want to leave us with? I mean, like, you know, just uh, to the community, one, thank you for, for hosting, for doing these things, for having a conversation out there in the, within the community so that, you know, individuals can understand that this can happen to you. Like, it can happen to you. Like, I, I believe, like, you know, oftentimes, People's, you know, reminders of that when they say, hey, look, you know, you look like such and such. Anybody ever said that you look like this? It's for that reason people sit in prison innocently because they look like someone else because of a mistaken identification or a cross-racial identification issue that's transpired in an overzealous individual. So I appreciate the work that you're doing for spreading the word and getting that out there and to the audience to continue to listen and continue to tap in and continue to on every Wednesday to listen to these stories of individuals like myself that sat in prison for crimes we didn't commit. Um, and understand that, you know, we suffer not a post-traumatic stress because our post-traumatic stress come from the communities that we grew up in that was riddled with drugs, gangs, and violence. Mm. We're now suffering not only with that, but also with a prison traumatic stress where we have to be at, where we're actually hyper vigilant about everything and overly concerned about all. And so again, I thank you for the work that you're doing as well. In other words, to help us on the, in this community, in other words, to heal from the harm in which has happened to us. Thank you. Are you on social media? Yes, I am. Uh, I am on the social media, John Rady Nation. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. Uh, I'm also on there on my name, Obi Anthony. You can also find me up under those things as well and we also have a website too as well you can find us on the web um, on the exonerated once again thank you obi anthony he spent 18 years behind bars for a crime he did not commit he was officially exonerated in 2011 i thank you for sharing your story brother be safe thank you very much